We made it to another milestone episode of The Far Middle, 150. My goodness, how did we accomplish that? And have all this fun while doing it. I want to thank you, constant listener, for hanging with me all these episodes. And we need to thank Dr. James Burke of Connections for giving us the inspiration to structure each episode, connecting those dots via our version, a far middle version of his famous Connections series. So here's to another 150 episodes of Far Middle Explorations and Musings. With such a prominent episode number, we need a compelling sports dedication. One that sits atop the greats, as a great of greats, and one that epitomizes and embraces the attributes of the far middle. Doing, achieving, hard work, being rational. Sometimes uh, the latter set of attributes is tough to find in the world of coddled athletes that you see today. And I was sort of feeling the pressure here when thinking this one over, to be honest. I wanted a dedication would be fitting for 150, but indeed, I think I did find one. And I think it checks all the boxes that we were looking for. Most aficionados of his sport place him on the Mount Rushmore of the sport all time. And if not on the Mount Rushmore, certainly top six all time. And he didn't transcend the sport as much as he subsumed the sport that he played in. He reformed and remade the sport into his personal image that lasts to this day. His nickname says it all, Mr. Hockey. Yeah, I'm talking about Gordy Howe, often considered the most complete player to ever play the game and one of the greatest of all time. Gordy Howe finished top five in regular season scoring for 20 consecutive seasons. 20. Will we ever see anything like it again? Maybe, perhaps, Connor McDavid, but you know, he's only about a third of the way home on that journey, so he's got a long way to go. Bobby Orr, who was a prior dedication subject of the far middle, and the greatest defenseman in the history of hockey, and on most people's hockey Mount Rushmore as well, is, I think you would agree, sort of an expert when it comes to hockey and its greats. He wrote the foreword for Mr. Hockey, My Story, which was Gordie Howe's biography, and here's what Orr said about Gordie Howe. Quote, I'm not talking about being one of the greatest hockey players ever. I'm talking about being the greatest player ever, period. Think of it this way. Today, if a player cracks the top five in scoring in the NHL, he's considered a star. Do it a couple of years in a row and you're a superstar. Alex Ovechkin did it once. Sidney Crosby has done it back-to-back twice. Steve Stamkos managed it four years in a row. You get the idea. You have to be a pretty good hockey player to make that list even once. Well, Gordy Howe did it 20 years in a row. That's right, 20. How do you begin to do justice to a legacy like that? Maybe we should compare him to the greats in other sports. When you look at golf and the way in which that game celebrates legends, such as Arnold Palmer and Jack Nicklaus, you get a sense of what Gordie Howe means to hockey, end quote. That's the words of Bobby Orr. And he did uh, sort of close with another interesting sentence that sort of sums it up. Gordie is a quiet and humble man, but I don't think I've ever met anyone with a more determined will to win. It's from Bobby Orr himself. Humble roots indeed for the boy who would become Mr. Hockey, uh, born in 1928 in a tiny village outside of Saskatoon, one of nine kids in a poor family during the Depression. He began playing hockey at age eight, and he quit school during the Depression to work in construction. And then he left that area around Saskatoon at 16 to pursue his hockey career. He came up tough. Now, not surprisingly, when you consider that upbringing, Howe was the epitome of tough as a player. Later in life, he ended up with soft spots in his skull from the years of beatings that he took on the ice. And his elbows, they were always inflamed after decades of using them to inflict pain on others. He ended up playing over 2,400 games as a pro, 975 goals. Over 800 of those were in the NHL, four Stanley Cups, and an unbelievable five decades of pro hockey. On the ice, he was nasty, and he dished out cross-checks. Off the ice, he was polite and humble. Quite the contrast. Now, here's how prevalent Howe is to the game of hockey. There's what's called a Gordy Howe hat trick, which is a variation of the traditional hat trick, which a player scores three goals. But a Gordy Howe hat trick, it's a little different. It's accomplished when a player collects a goal, an assist, and a fight in the same game. Now, that term was coined by a 1950 sports writer, But interestingly, Howe accomplished that feat only twice in his five-decade career. 
but it does in a way perfectly sum him up. Howe's son Marty once remarked, the Gordy Howe hat trick should really be a goal, an assist, and a cross check to the face. That might be more accurate. Yeah, and watch those elbows too, I might add. Uh, Self-made, tough, longevity, humble, a doer, imposing his will and image over an entire sport. Yeah, who better than Mr. Hockey to serve as our dedication subject for episode 150? All right, now that we're warmed up, fired up with a proper dedication, let's start moving through our connections for this week's episode. And, you know, they need to be super special connections, ones that are fitting and meet the billing and standard of that historic episode 150. Gordy Howe is an excellent dedication subject from sport because, as we said, He's an individual, redefined, and then subsequently set the template for what the ideal was when it came to being a hockey player. You know, talented and tough on the ice, yet humble and approachable off the ice. Now, I'd like to think the far middle over the past 150 weeks has developed a template, dare I say an ideal, for civil public discourse. And I'm quite proud about that. The best way I can summarize it is to illustrate it for you with what has become without a doubt the most common feedback that I receive regarding this podcast. I don't know how many people. It has to be by now in the hundreds, and maybe yourself included is, is one of that group, who have told me in person or in email or whatever something similar to the following line. Hey, Nick, I love the podcast, and although I don't agree with everything you say or all of your positions, in total, the far middle is awesome. Yeah, that's the most common and typical response that I get for far middle feedback. And what I love most about that feedback is found within the part of, although I don't agree with everything that you say or all of your positions. Why? Because first and foremost, I've got complete conviction that it's incredibly important in a society and within a nation like ours to be willing and confident enough and able to express honest opinions and views in a public forum or in the public square, so to speak. Yeah, it's your basic freedom of speech and freedom of expression First Amendment issue. And if we lose that by soft or hard coercion or by government or by the tyranny of the majority or by a small minority of elites in control, then we lose everything. And the most common feedback response also provides me a bit of pleasure because it highlights how efforts like the far middle, it can reinforce, validate and confirm the inherently unique attributes of individual human beings. The reason that most people caveat their interest in the far middle with the, although I don't agree with everything you say comment, is that no two individuals are alike when you tally all their individual views on specific issues and items of the day. Think of it as analogous to DNA. No two humans share identical DNA or identical fingerprints, even though humans have much in common when it comes to shared DNA and fingerprints. It's the same for ideological, philosophical, political, religious, and economic makeup. Call it maybe our intellectual DNA, for lack of a better term. And if I were to find someone out there, a constant listener, let's say, who shared the exact same identical intellectual DNA in total that I have, the exact same, mind you, that constant listener and I would both likely be a bit freaked out. Because instead of looking at our body double in the case of identical DNA or fingerprints, we would be looking at our intellectual mental doubles. And that is impossible in a free thinking society that values individuality. Impossible. Indeed, the uh, far middle serving as validation of the unique individuality of humans in a free society, it connects quite nicely with another realization looking back these past 150 episodes. I prided myself on always trying to be thinking and executing with a chess player's mentality instead of a checkers player's mentality. And I'll admit I'm one of the most consistent abusers of that phraseology. I wear it out on the importance of uh, playing chess and not checkers when thinking strategically or big picture. So if you stick around me long enough, I will inevitably start to spout that off. But, you know, having the benefit of 150 episodes of experience now under the belt It makes me realize that the road and journey to today, it was paved more by applying a checkers player's mentality. So allow me to explain. Through the years, I would agree to, let's say, give a speech on a certain subject to a certain group. 
And I would perform this function every so often as part of my professional duties. And those speeches and the themes and the positions, they started to accumulate over the course of a career. They add up. And I may have been discussing in a speech, say, strategic views using that chess player's mindset, but the individual discrete event or work product or speech, it was reactionary to a request. And it was viewed in a vacuum unrelated to the one before it and the next one coming up. You got it done. You moved on to the next thing. Very much a checkers player's mindset with the advocacy effort historically. Then a few years ago, I concocted the silly idea of tying together, making those now famous connections to the individual speeches and topics and issues that accumulated over the course of years. And there was commonality of connections across those topics, which led to the writing of the book Precipice, The Left's Campaign to Destroy America. And that was awesome. But at the time, it was still the result of a checkers player's mindset. Write and publish the book, and that was about it. Move on. Yet when the book was published, there was an immediate desire to explain the book in both the broader context as well as chapter by chapter and theme by theme. What would be the best way of going about that? Almost looking for building a companion platform to help shepherd the reader through precipice. And that constant listener was the genesis of episode number one of The Far Middle. In fact, the first dozen or so episodes of The Far Middle, you might recall, they focus exclusively on discussing precipice chapter by chapter. It's another decision coming from that checkers player's mindset that led subsequently to the Far Middle podcast. Well, once a dozen or so episodes were published and precipice was fully covered, the decision point was arrived at as to what to do next. And that's when finally I started to evolve at least a bit more toward the chess player's mindset. That's when the Far Middle evolved into a standalone effort covering various issues and subjects in a less than 30-minute time frame each week. Each episode distinctly unique, with no two episodes looking exactly the same, but yet all 150 episodes tying together a handful of core themes consistently. Uniquely connected. How about that? Now, strangely enough, applying a checkers player's mindset over the years, it helped me to become better at applying the chess player's mindset when thinking ahead. It's one of life's interesting ironies, I suppose. That's an irony that just so happens to elegantly flow into a connection discussing what one of those core themes of the far middle over the past 150 episodes has been. We could probably choose from a handful, granted a small handful, of those core themes, but there's one that is especially important, and it's been identified and articulated by various great thinkers through history, so it's one that we can appropriate and mimic to a certain extent. The theme I speak of was artfully summarized by the author and philosopher Ayn Rand, one of my personal faves. She penned an essay back in the 1960s whose title was, Who Will Protect Us From Our Protectors? And you don't need to be an objectivist like she was or subscribe to her philosophies or views to appreciate the value of what she was highlighting in this essay. Rand was hyper-focused on exposing an illogical and dangerous double standard that individuals are helpless and they're incapable of looking after their own self-interests, while government and the bureaucrat or the expert, they're omnipotent and perfect in decision-making on behalf of others in society. This speaks to how the state can justify control of the individual while under the cover of looking after the mindless and helpless individual's best interests or the public good, as we often hear it packaged. This double standard exists across various government policies and regulations. Consider the numerous ways government limits the ability of the private sector to advocate, promote, or advertise products and services, all in the official name of what? Of protecting the hapless consumer or helpless person against misleading claims and false advertising by evil business, and then allowing the consumer to make supposed informed decisions because government's going to ensure that the consumer has all the facts needed to make the right decisions. Yet the most important decisions that an individual makes in our society is who to vote for in a political campaign or election, right? Because that individual and the elected body in total, they're going to make decisions that affect the voter's future, the voter's freedom, and the voter's life. You make the wrong decision at the ballot box, it's got enormous implications way beyond what cereal or car you're going to purchase. 
But we don't see political leaders rejecting or refraining from all kinds of nonsensical, illogical, baseless promises and statements. Politicians and bureaucrats deny the public facts and data that are needed to make the right decisions. When you get down to it, from elections to laws, the most important and impactful decisions made by or on behalf of the public, they're subjected to the most egregious misstatements and false advertising. It's a double standard that on one hand demands the individual in the private sector be held to a standard that the other individual in public office or government knowingly will not satisfy. It's not just unethical, it's illogical. And as the scope and depth of government and bureaucratic control grow, it creates an almost insurmountable problem. The state, when you think this through, controls commerce, science, media, everything, creating a massive dilemma that speaks to the title of the Rand essay. The state's promoted as the protector for the individual, the little guy's shield. But who then protects the individual from the out-of-control protector when that protector explodes in size and scope? If there's no acceptable answer and we're at the mercy of our protectors, it leads inevitably to a ruled class and a ruling class, subjects and kings, the inferior led by the superior. That's not America, constant listeners, but that is where we've been heading for far too long in America. And such a concept and dilemma is one of the reasons the far middle exists, because today the voter, business person, doer, individual thinker, they all need to be part amateur economists, scientists, journalists, and civics expert. Knowledge is power, and we must dare to know, as Kant once implored, which means the individual in today's America is yearning for access to platforms providing at least basic insight into these areas. And I hope that the far middle has succeeded in doing such over the past 150 episodes. This dilemma sparks and arcs to the next connection into another core topic that we've discussed time and again on the far middle. And that is the contrast between two things. On one hand, what the founding of the United States was based upon, how it's supposed to be when it comes to government power Versus, on the other hand, what we become and how prevalent government is today. There's a huge difference between the two. What the founding fathers and what our Constitution intended is quite clear. Limited and simple government. The government being based upon the will of the body of the citizenry. This intention is staring us in the face with the structure of the Constitution itself. And I've always found this fascinating. If you consider the power, let's say, of the legislature, which is a key Uh, part of the Constitution. So Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution lays out the powers of Congress. Easy enough. And there are 18 paragraphs that comprise it. Many of those 18 paragraphs are only a single sentence. It's unbelievably concise. And of those 18 paragraphs, seven deal with national defense, one deals with piracy, and there's one dealing with who runs the District of Columbia, And then the remaining, what is that, nine if my math is correct, the remaining nine paragraphs, they deal with commerce and the regulation of it. And there's something in those nine paragraphs on commerce, on running a post office, weights and measures, coinage, that kind of stuff. That's it when it comes to the power of a federal Congress. All other powers were reserved to the states and local governments and ultimately to the people. That's because our government was intended to be representative government. Now, I was always taught in high school history classes and civics classes that this meant no king and instead an elected president. But it also means something else, perhaps more important for us today. It also means that a bureaucrat inside of government cannot act as a pseudo-sovereign who's unanswerable and unaccountable to the citizens. And therein lies a substantial problem when it comes to today's federal government. Yeah, the sovereignty was supposed to sit with the regular citizen and the normal individual outside of the government, whether it be state, local, or federal. You couple that with a design towards small or, dare I say, minimal government, and you should have a government footprint in economy and society that is a fraction, a tiny fraction, of what it has become today. But instead, we've got a monster on our hands run by bureaucrats that performs its own bidding at the expense of the individual, the private sector, and liberty. 
not what the founding fathers intended, and definitely not the ideal. The founders, they understood that Americans were no more exceptional than anyone else, at least with respect to the danger of government and bureaucrat desiring to exert power. Now, what did I just say? That's right. In many ways, the framers' answer through the Constitution's latticework was to spread power as widely and as thinly as possible to avoid the tendency or danger to move toward tyranny. Think it through. The Constitution, it sets up on one hand checks and balances across a legislative, executive, and judicial branch to dilute power. It sets out two layers of federalism with the national and state government to dilute power. And it said the federal legislative branch was to be split into two additional houses and be bicameral with a House and a Senate to dilute power. The Constitution looks to dilute power of the state. The founders were looking to avoid tyranny by the state upon the individual. And some might say this is proof that the founders didn't think Americans were exceptional or that the Constitution doesn't contemplate an exceptional America. I don't think that's the case. America is indeed exceptional, but we're not different when it comes to the few in the corridors of power looking to rule over the many who are supposed to be the citizens, but who are viewed by those in power as potential subjects. We're not immune to that any more than other people in other nations are or have been through history. And that is what the framers look to avoid and that the Constitution was designed to protect from. All that state control via bureaucrat, it comes at a price to the individual for sure. And I'd like to now make a connection to two authors who have been far middle stalwarts, uh, patron saints of the podcast, so to speak, George Orwell and Aldous Huxley, the former with 1984 and the latter with Brave New World. Always found those two works similar but different in one key aspect, at least. Similar, of course, in their highlighting the danger and dystopia of state control but different in the means or the tactics used by the state to exert that control on the individual. Orwell's dystopian vision of the future, described in 1984, it's based on totalitarian suppression, where the bureaucrat happily applies physical violence to suppress freedom of the citizens and the individual. But compare that to what we read in Huxley's Brave New World, where he envisions a dystopia where violence by the state, it's no longer necessary. State violence has become old school obsolete in Brave New World because that scenario that Huxley envisioned, it's where government controls by psychological manipulation of the masses. Physical violence is obsolete because human behavior is controlled. Your thoughts and feelings, they're curated. And that's a much more efficient, long-term, lasting, and impactful path for making the individual a mindless follower, a sheep, where the state is going to serve as the master and the shepherd. And I don't want to be part of such a flock, constant listeners. The two authors discussed this very topic in 1949. Orwell sent a copy of 1984 to Huxley, hot off the press upon publishing. And Huxley wrote back to Orwell, thanking him for the book and offering up the following portions of his letter. Now give this 1949 writing a listen and tell me it doesn't send chills down your spine in 2024. This is Huxley again, writing to Orwell. Quote, My own belief is that the ruling oligarchy will find less arduous and wasteful ways of governing and of satisfying its lust for power. And these ways will resemble those which I described in Brave New World. Within the next generation, I believe that the world's rulers will discover the infant conditioning and narco-hypnosis are more efficient as instruments of government than clubs and prisons, and that the lust for power can be just as completely satisfied by suggesting people into loving their servitude, as by flogging and kicking them into obedience, end quote. Wow, Huxley saw it coming. And like the Orwells and Huxleys back then, we have a shared duty to advocate on behalf of the individual in liberty today. I hope I've held your attention and lived up to the standards for this milestone 150th episode of The Far Middle. And as Billy Joel once sang, I've loved these days over the past 150 weeks. Keep doing, and we will reconnect again next week.